When the Prophet brought the teaching of Islam, he brought a teaching of equality where the rich and poor were now equal. Men and women had an equal status in society. He was telling the world two things. One was how to treat daughters with respect and how to respect women in general. And also the fact that in times to come, he will be indebted to Fatima and her progeny for the propagation and survival of his divine message. The message of love, of equality, of justice, of peace, not a message of what Islam has now is interpreted to be. At a very young age, she accomplished so much. In 18 years of life, we find that she leaves a legacy like none other. She is one woman who is the axis between both Imamat and, and Nabuat. To have someone like Fatima Zara is a treasure. It's really something that instead of having it only in books and words, and you should be like this, and you should aspire to be so, when you actually see a person becoming like that, it really encourages you and tells you that this is possible. It's possible to be generous like Father. It's possible to be wise like Father. It's possible to be firm in faith like Father. O oh people, know that I am Fatima. And my father is Muhammad. I will say that repeatedly and continuously. I do not say what I am saying mistakenly, nor do I do what I do aimlessly. A messenger has come to you from among yourselves. So if you know him, and you know who he is, you will see that he is my father, not the father of any of your women. Lady Fatima moved from the home of prophethood to the house of Imamat, successorship and guardianship. This turn in Fatima's life allowed her to become the companion of the father of the Imams. As days passed, Fatima's life became more beautiful and splendid, for she lived in an atmosphere of sanctity and chaste, surrounded by modesty and humbleness. She aided her husband in his worldly and religious affairs and cooperated with him in achieving his exalted goals. This harmony in their life was preferred by the ideological tranquility they both enjoyed and the respect and glorification they held for each other. Fatima realized the great rank her husband enjoyed. She respected him in the best manner as a Muslim woman should respect her Imam, for she recognized that Ali was the dearest person to Allah's Messenger, the holder of the great guardianship, the possessor of absolute imamate.
the Prophet's brother, successor and heir, the possessor of excellent talents, his long-standing service to Islam was also apparent to everyone. Likewise, Ali salam respected Fatima, not only because she was his wife, but also because she was the most beloved to Allah's Messenger, the mistress of all women, and her sanctity was part of the Prophet's peace be upon him. The glad tidings received by the Prophet were that you will be uh, having a, a, a newborn soon in the family and the Prophet was told that your children are from Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Prophet says on occasions that usually people's children are through their own line my line is through the line of Ali ibn Abi Talib so the children of Ali, the children of Fatima are actually my children and this gives you a special uh, mention to later on when we talk about the descendants of the Prophet why they are called Abna Rasulullah why we say they are the sons of Rasulullah because it's the decree of Allah that Fatima, which we mentioned was al kawthar the abundance, her line is actually the Prophet's line and the Prophet's children come from her. On the 15th of, of Shah Ramadan in the year 3 after Hijrah, we, we, we have the birth of Sayyidah Fatima's first son, Imam al-Hasan. And this was the new dimension to the Qawthar that Allah had given Rasulullah. The, it was... The, it was the extension of his lineage now. And so he congratulated Amin Mumin and Fatima Salamullah and said, Have you named him? And Fatima said, I told Ali to name him. And Ali said, Ya Rasulullah, I would not have the, uh, the audacity to name my child before you. So Rasulullah said, And I would not have the audacity to name my child before, before the uh, highest Lord appoints a name for him. And thereupon, Jibrail descended and says, Allah congratulates you and Fatima and Ali on this newborn and says to name him the name of the first son of Harun. And so Rasulullah said, what was the name of the first son? And he said, Shubba. And the Prophet says that this, my tongue is Arabic. I cannot, this is not, I cannot say this word. So then they say that the Arabic equivalent of Shubbar is Al-Hasan and the Prophet calls the baby Al-Hasan. They recite Adhan and Nakama in his ears and after seven days they shave his hair and the weight of his hair in gold, they give that amount of money to charity. So this was the uh, event of the birth of Imam Al-Hasan and from the beginning uh, Imam Al-Hasan was probably seen more by the Prophet than his own father. He would carry him, he would chew his food for him, uh, he would take him with him into the mosque. Uh, the Prophet in the morning would like to see him. He would come by in the afternoon and inquire, how is my son? And in the evenings he would like to spend some time reciting the Quran with Imam al-Hasan. And this was something that he carried out with the rest of uh, his grandchildren. But it, it shows you the, the attempt by the Prophet to tell people, this is how you behave with children. We find that six months later, Bibi Fatima the Zahra falls pregnant with the with with and, and gives birth to her second child, Imam al Hussein. However, the birth of the second son is slightly different. The night before that Imam Hussein is born, Um Ayman has a dream and she wakes up crying. She goes to the Prophet and says, Surely I've had a disturbing dream. The Prophet says to Um Ayman, What have you dreamt? She says, that I have dreamt that one of your limbs is in my house. Rasulullah says, Your eyes were asleep, yet you dreamt a good thing. She has, he says, You, one of my one of my descendants will be born in your house and you will give that child to me. After a short amount of time, the Prophet was giving glad tidings that uh, Fatima is to give birth soon and at the day of the birth, the Prophet arrived in similar circumstances to find that there was a male child and he was informed by Jibra'il, call him uh, Shubair. On both occasions, Jibra'il appears to Rasulullah and says, uh, O Apostle of God, Arabs will find it difficult to pronounce Hebrew names. Would you give them the name of Hassan and Hussein, respectively? And before that, there, were no, there was nobody who was called Hassan and Hussein. So these the names were given to the grandson of Rasulullah by divine command. And so he was informed that uh, Al-Hussein uh, was the savior of the Ummah, of the Prophet. He was told that Al-Hussein is the one who will save your Ummah. Al-Hussein is the one who your Shia and your supporters, if they ask Allah 
to forgive them by his name, Allah will answer, will answer their dua. But this came at a price. When Imam al Hussein was born, we know that Jibreel comes down and he narrates to Rasulullah the tragedies that will befall on Imam al Hussein. This child of yours, this al Hussein, this newborn, will be killed, will be slaughtered by some people of this ummah. And so, and that is why we find that he is he is full of remorse at the birth of Imam al Hussein. And though the Prophet was upset that the news of al Hussein's death was already foretold, he was glad that Imam al Hussein would have a special place in history, that he would be the one to save the Ummah in later times. Then a year later in 5 AH, the Lady Fatima alayhi salam gives birth to a daughter who they call Zainab, Zainab, the beauty of her father. And again, this birth is clouded with, with, with grief and remorse because Rasulullah is told of the calamities that will befall on her. And she was the first uh, female child, again the Prophet, uh, received glad tidings. He was informed of the birth before it happened and he was there during the moment of the birth. Uh, practiced the sunnah same way, reciting the adhan and the iqamah and so on. And likewise with the fourth child, Umm Kulthum. And with these four children, the Prophet's uh, neighbors, which were Fatima and Ali, their house was full of joyous sounds. The Prophet used to love his grandchildren, especially Al Hassan and Al Hussein. He used to say that Hassan and Hussein are a part of me. Whoever, whoever angers them angers me and Allah, and whoever pleases them pleases me and Allah. It is said that one time Imam Al Hassan walks into the mosque of the Prophet and they trip over, and the Prophet comes down from the mimbar and holds them in his arms. Nobody was really interested in their early years and upbringing, but the Prophet would spend time with an infant, with a child. He would play with the child and he would talk with the child and he would carry him on his back. And people were surprised, you know, why would an, an elderly man behave such a way with a young infant? It wasn't seen as manly enough. It wasn't seen as the correct way to behave with children. Children will just grow up by themselves. Yeah, the Prophet shows you have to invest in them. There is a, an account where Rasulullah was praying his salat and his sujood was lasted longer than, than, than maybe they, they, they would normally. And people questioned him as to why it lasted so long. Was he re was he receiving revelation? He said, no, Hussein had climbed onto my back and so I prolonged my sujood until he wanted to, to dismount from me. And alhamdulillah, we have the uh, numerous ahadith and stories of how the Prophet behaved with the children, how he dealt with the children himself and how he spent much of his time educating them. And this is the role also of the mother Fatima to, Zara, to influence them in this way to make sure that when they grow up they represent the Holy Prophet in the best manner. From when the time that she was a mother with her children, when she has a tasbih in her hand and Al Hassan and Imam Hussein come to her and say, Oh mother, who do you love more? Hassan or H Hassan or Hussein? And she says that she drops the tasbih at that moment and the tasbih the beads of the tasbih fall on the floor. And they, she says that whoever picks up the most beads, I love that child the most. And the, both the children pick up the beads and the last bead splits into half and to show that she loves them equally. So she spent those years seeing her father uh, on a daily basis, seeing him smile. They spent happy times together. She had Al Hassan and Hussein and Zainab and Umm Kumathum, a happy family. It was the peak of her life in terms of the happiness with the Prophet. It was a peak in terms of the happiness with Amir al Mu'mineen. She spent those years building her family life, uh, living her life out to the fullest in observance of her ibadah, in observance of her high morals and akhlaq, in observance of the happy family life that we should all aspire to. The Prophet, peace be upon him, recommended Fatima not to insist on Imam Ali to buy her anything from the pleasures of this worldly life. She said to Imam Ali, The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, had forbidden me from asking you for anything. He said to me, Do not ask your cousin for anything. If he himself brings you something, accept it. Otherwise, do not ask him for anything. The life of Imam Ali and Fatima was full of love and friendliness. About that, Imam Ali said, By Allah, I did never anger her or force her to do something unwillingly. She also did never anger me, nor did she disobey me in anything at all. When I looked at her, my griefs and sorrows were relieved. When we reflect on the life of Fatima, we see that uh, the period when she was married to Amin al during the lifetime of the Prophet had everything in it. 
It was difficult, yes, but it was also a happy time. It was a time of jihad for both men and women. It was a time when uh, Fatima played a crucial role in spreading the message of Islam and the Risala. And it was a time when she had an impact on everybody. She had an impact on uh, parents, fathers of the day, when they saw the Prophet behaving with her in this way, and when he heard how Fatima treated him so that he called her Ummu Abiha, the mother of her father. It sent people back to their homes thinking, how should I behave with my daughter? It sent daughters and wives back to their home thinking, how should we behave uh, as wives and as daughters? How should we educate our daughters to be like this? And this had an impact on the family life of Medina because before then nobody had seen a family like the family of Ali and Fatima, like the family, like the household of the Prophet. Nobody had seen this before. Men and women can learn from the life of Fatima to Zahra that every single action that you do is for the sake of Allah, for the pleasure of Allah. From the time when she was helping the Prophet of Islam, her father, from being the Umm Abiha, the mother of her father, from the time she was a wife, where Imam Ali says that I never angered Fatima, nor did, nor did I displease her, nor did she, nor did I ever make her do anything that she didn't want to do. In fact, when I looked at Fatima, all my depression and sadness would go away. And this really shows you that Fatima took her duty seriously. This is the jihad of a woman and a wife and a husband, uh, the wife and a daughter, and also of a mother. She took it very, very seriously. And she showed everybody else that, look, we have to complement each other and we have to work as partners. Husbands and men have a role. Us as women have an equally important role. When they go off to do their duties, it's not that we don't have anything to do. We have as much duties, if not much more than they do. And sometimes we have to take on their duties as well. If they go and leave town to go out to fight or to seek uh, sustenance, we have to then take out the, carry out the daily duties. Sometimes we will have to uh, earn income, we will have to work. That love between husband and wife that they had, Imam Ali says that we were like two pigeons cooing in a nest. The understanding between the two of them, that when Imam Ali would come home and there would be not enough food on the table, there wasn't that argument and fighting and disagreement. They understood each other, they trusted each other. And I think this uh, reflects well for modern life that perhaps we should take seriously the fact that a man and woman will need to work together can't only be the woman's duties, it can't only be the man's duties. It, it, in modern day life, as it was back then, one person can't do everything. And you have to share and work together, otherwise you won't be able to carry out all the family duties. We, we read about the fact that they lived a very uh, difficult life, in the sense of uh, uh, there was lack of money, lack of provisions in general, and that charity always took a toll on their personal wealth. So you, it would be right to say that the life of Ali and Fatima was uh, a struggle, a jihad in itself. A new meaning of the jihad is this a struggle in the way of God to preserve life rather than to take life. To give birth to life, to preserve it, to nurture it, and to, indul and to indulge in acts of generosity and charity. Her children often narrate, Al-Mam al Hassan often narrates that he sees his mother bowing and praying in Raku, praying for the family, the, for the people surrounding them. And Imam al Hassan asked her, Oh mother, why do you pray for others and not for yourself? And she says, Ajar kabla dar, first people outside of our home and then ourselves. So that example she gives to her children of prayer, of sacrifice, of helping other people, these morals that our society today can only dream of upholding. And so when we put this all together, the generosity of Ahl Bayt, the patience, turning towards Allah, helping others, forbearance and the akhlaq between a husband and a wife, we can see that the life of Fatima, though it was simple, it was built on love and partnership and piety and focus on serving the needs of Muslims generally rather than just the needs of individuals. The tradition states that Rasulullah arrived at the house of Fatima, salamu alayha. And she says that I saw my father and his face was absolutely radiant. And he, uh, despite the face being very radiant, he complained of weakness. And he said, oh Fatima, get me my Yemeni mantle to cover me. So Fatima Tazahra said, oh, oh Prophet of Islam, may illness be taken away from you. And she brings him this blanket. 
Then Imam Hassan comes inside the house and he says, Oh mother, I smell the fragrance of my grand my grandfather. And she said, Surely your grandfather is lying down under the Yemeni blanket. So Imam al Hassan goes to the Prophet and he says, Oh Prophet of Islam, Ya Rasulullah, may I join you under this blanket? And the Prophet says, Surely Hassan, you may join me under the blanket. Following that, moments later, the younger brother, Imam al Hassan, arrives, Imam al Hussein arrives. And Imam al Hussein says the same thing that, Oh mother, I can hear, I can smell the aroma of my grandfather's presence in this house. And Fatima salamu alayha points out the place where Rasulullah was sitting, where the Prophet of God was sitting. Imam al Hussein approaches Rasulullah and says, Oh grandfather, do I have your permission to join you, both of you, under the mantle? And he agrees, he confirms that he, his permission, he permits him, and Imam al Hussein joins him under the mantle. After a short time, Imam Ali alayhi salam comes in. He says, peace be upon you, O daughter of the Prophet. I smell the fragrance of my brother and cousin, Rasulullah, in the house. And Fatima to Zahra says, surely my father is under the blanket with your two sons, Al Hassan and Al Hussein. So Imam Ali approaches Rasulullah and says, O Rasulullah, do I have your permission to join you? Under the mantle. Imam Ali seeks permission to enter and he is granted it also. The fifth to enter the Qisar is Sayyidah Fatima the Zahra. And when she enters the Qisar, we know that this, this event happens in the house of Umm Salma. Umm Salma too asks for permission to enter. However, Rasulullah says, You may not enter, however, you are on the right path. And when all of them were covered under the corner of the mantle, Fatima says that when we were complete, then he raised the corner of the right hand, the, the, the corner which he held, of the mantle which he held in the right hand, to the heavens and he said, O oh God, these are my Ahlul Bayt. And whosoever harms them harms me, whosoever angers them angers me, whosoever fights for them fights for me, whosoever protects them protects me. Then Jibra'il in the heavens, the angels in the heavens are watching this scene and he's, says and the angels say to Allah Ya Rab wa man tahta al kisa Oh Allah who is under this blanket? And God said that there the five under the mantle are those but for whom I will, would not have created the heaven and the earth and life or anything else. And Allah says Hum Fatima wa abuha wa ba'liha wa banuha It is Fatima, her father, her husband and her sons. And Jibra'il says to Allah, O oh Allah, give me permission to descend down and join them. And Allah says, surely you are granted permission. Jibra'il appears at that point and says, O oh Rasulullah, God conveys his salam to you and he has conveyed to you a verse which says, <laughs> God has verily uh, decided to keep away from the, his Ahlul Bayt, from your Ahlul Bayt, uh, all kinds of evil, be their acts or deeds or thoughts and falsity and untruth from you. Thus establishing the infallibility of the Ahlul Bayt, that they would not do anything that would be wrong. From this verse of the Quran, the infallibility is extracted. We uh, see in this verse that when the Prophet uh, revealed it to the people, he would go then to the house of Ali, the house of Fatima, for six months on a daily basis. And he would knock on the door three times and recite this verse. Glad tidings, O people of the house, and, receive, and, and recite this verse in a loud voice. And sometimes he would enter and sit, and sometimes he would just recite the verses so people would know who are the Ahlul Bayt and walk away. And this was done for a period of six months so that nobody would have the excuse of saying, I don't know who this verse is about. Who are the Ahlul Bayt? It's not very clear for me. And the narrations are numerous that the Prophet would do this on a daily basis. God, when he selects his chosen people, he also tries and tests them. And the test arose in the case of the household of Fatima. And they were 
uh, sick so that the Prophet himself and Amin al Fatima were worried about their health. And so it was suggested, why do you not do a nidr? Why do you not make a vow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if Al Hassan al Hussein gets well, uh, we will, for example, fast a number of days or we'll give a certain amount of money and so on. And seeing that the Imam did not have many possessions, uh, they promised that the family would fast for three days if Al Hassan al Hussein uh, had improved health. Once the health is regained, we find that Imam Ali goes and he, he takes a loan of three units of, of barley. And he is about to engage in the three days of fasting. We find that the whole household of Bibi Fatima of Zahra engages in this. So not only does Imam Ali and Bibi Fatima engage in the three days of fasting, but so does Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, and Fizla. The time for iftar had come after a long day of fasting, and it was hot and a difficult day. A knock on the door, just as, as they're about to have their iftar. And a voice calls out, O Ahlu Bayt al O the people of, or the household of prophethood, give me something to eat, for I am miskeen, which is not just poor, which is abysmally poor. As they were about to break the fast, a man appeared on the door and said, I am an indigent and I need food and I have nothing to, uh, uh, to eat for tonight. And so we find that all five members of the household give the loaves of bread, they drink water, and then they set their intentions to fast for the next day. The next day, a similar circumstance where they're preparing a small piece of bread for their iftar, a, uh, a young boy knocks on the door and says, I'm an orphan. A very young man, he said, I'm an orphan and I have no one to care for, for me and I would like someone to give me food. And uh, again, Imam Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein, alayhi, alayhi they went and gave away their food to this man. On the third fast, the same thing, she breaks her five loaves of bread. At the time, a prisoner, a captive of war comes and says, this is the household of the Ahlul Bayt, please feed us. And again, they give away their three loaves of bread and they are satisfied with just water. When that was done, a verse was revealed by God through the Prophet and the Prophet arrived that evening and he saw that the family of Fatima, her husband and her two sons, were ex extremely weak because they had been fasting consecutively for three days and just breaking their fast with water. And the Prophet says, Ya Ma'ashar al-Anbiya, or people who are uh, with the Prophets, or family of the Prophet, you have received almost a whole surah, Surah Al-Insan, about you and Allah has given you glad tidings of Jannah describing to you what paradise is like. And he said that you were tried and God was pleased with you for the one who came was an angel in the form of a captive, an indigent and an orphan. And the verse that has been revealed is And they have given to the miskeen uh, and the uh, orphan and the captive though they wanted it the verse says though they wanted what they wanted the pleasure of Allah or they wanted to eat the food themselves and the narrators say both they wanted to eat it because they were so hungry yet they still gave it away and also they gave it away because they wanted to please Allah and they say to them we don't want anything from you you don't need to thank us you don't need to say anything and the narration says that they only gave the food without saying a word Give the food and close the door so that these people will not have to, uh, you know, show their thanks. And I mean, when we stand there and they can say, you are such a great person, you are so kind. And this is the akhlaq of the NBA and the Imams, to not need someone to say thank you and to someone to say kind words. Now, that act of charity 
is, became the cornerstone of the practice of the Ahlul Bayt for generations to come.